Lembrando que esse evento ele é realizado pela Regional Sul da Associação Brasileira de Polímeros, com o apoio da ABPOL 7 e também dos nossos patrocinadores e apoiadores ali, a MTS do Brasil, a Taxi Glass e o Instituto Senai de Tecnologia. Tá? Não se esqueçam de é, acessar o nosso Mentimeter, vocês têm ali o código, tá? É por ali que a gente controla a presença de vocês, vocês não devem esquecer de colocar o nome e instituição e também se cadastrar para fazer as perguntas né, para o nosso palestrante de hoje. Né? Lembrando que para receber o certificado, os participantes devem ter é, assistido pelo menos cinco dos nossos webinars. Tá? Uma outra informação importante antes de começar é que todos os, os seminários ou os webinars eles estão sendo gravados e a gente vai disponibilizar eles para vocês né, na, no canal oficial da ABPOL no YouTube. Eu vou colocar para vocês ali no chat daqui a pouquinho o link para vocês já, já ficarem familiarizados com o canal, curtam o canal e por ali a gente vai colocar então os vídeos de todas é, as apresentações. Tá? Antes de passar a palavra para o professor Sandro, nosso hoster, uh, I would like to thank you, uh, Professor Andrea, in name of uh, Abipol Sul, for you accepting this invitation to present this webinar today. It's a pleasure to us receive you here. Grazie mille. Uh, Sandro, pode, pode tocar. Ok. Uh, eu... But I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start start the English now, okay? And so Andrea can participate <laughs> as well. But I, I just want to, before we start, Andrea, before I introduce you, I want to uh, to mention our our supporters: huh? MTS, Sistema do Brasil, Taxi Glass, e o Instituto Senai de Inovação. They are supporting us this the, this webinars from Abipossu, okay. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing here. You can, you can start sharing yours and then I will introduce you. Okay, so today is, today is, it's, it's my pleasure, it's our pleasure to receive Professor Andrea Manis uh, from Politecnico di Milano. He is uh, in Italy, of course, in Milan, Milano. Uh, he's an associate professor there. And I'm going to read a brief, a brief resume, his resume here, okay. He's involved in both higher education and research. His main research topics are in the field of structural engineering, machine design, and mechanical behavior of materials. We focus on extreme loading conditions and vulnerability. He has direct expertise in testing modeling components and complex systems made by metals, composites, including nanocomposites, and ceramics, including glass. He has actively participated to several EU, EDA, European Defense Agency, national and industrial projects. He has published more than 120 papers. His age index is 21, according to Scopus, and referred international journals and congresses. Since 2019, He is a member of the Editorial Advisory Board of International Journal of Impact Engineering. Okay, so this is the resume of Professor Andrea Manis, and his talk is going to be on the ballistic impact on composite materials, uh, including experimental numerical analysis. Uh, I want to, to remind everyone that you can, you can type your questions using the Mentimeter uh, software okay i put the instructions there in the chat so i can follow the mentimeter software to ask him the questions okay to forward to him the questions you can type the questions in portuguese as well and i'll, I'll translate to to english to andrea Manis. so please professor andrea Manis, it's it's again an honor a pleasure to have you here to talk to us uh, please uh, feel free to start our seminar thank you again Grazie mille for having accepted this invitation. You are welcome, you are welcome. Uh, first of all, many thanks, Sandro, for the nice presentation. Let me see that it's also an honor for me to be here. I hope that you can hear me clearly. 
uh, I can I start the presentation. Uh, first of all, uh, a few words, a few general words about what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about ballistic impact on composite materials. Uh, in the end of the presentation, I will I will talk also about uh, composite in a larger view. So I will so about composite means uh, composite plus ceramic material, but the main course is composite material. So composite fiber reinforced composite material. Uh, at present, fiber reinforced composite material are preferred choice for manufacturing ballistic shield. We will try to understand why. I will, uh, um, I will show you what is my research topic in this, in this field. It means that I will not show let's say a resume of what is uh, the global trend of composite material uh, in, involved in ballistic impact but i will show you what are my research topic what, what are my choice and i will try to explain why i do this kind of research i will discuss a little bit about material in the beginning of the presentation then i will move to experimental tests that are really that are crucial, are still vital for the assessment of a composite protection. But as you will see, experimental tests, or probably as you will know, experimental tests are affected by many parameters, a lot of uncertainties. So uh, what is the actual trend is to try to boost predictive modeling approaches. Predictive modeling approaches are model. So they try to catch the physics behind the phenomenon and they try to replicate in the best way. Uh, there are different kind, different families of predictive approach. In this presentation, I will talk about numerical modeling approach. As I told you, I will talk about what are my research, and my research is about uh, this topic. Few words about the place in which I work, Polytechnic of Milan. Polytechnic of Milan is one of the largest university in Italy, is the largest technical university in Italy. We are quite, we are old, but not, uh, let's say, not, uh, not uh, extremely old. As you know, in Italy, there is a University of Bologna that is the older university in the, in the world. We are quite young, uh, 150 years is uh, we uh, we born in 8063. We have several campus. In Polytechnic of Milan, we have three main faculty, architecture, design, and engineering. And uh, we have approximately from 40 to 50,000 students every year. Uh, we have several departments, 12 departments. I work inside the departments of mechanical engineering. Uh, Department of Mechanical Engineering, uh, we have uh, the pleasure to have a lot of facilities, uh, ex experimental facilities. We have uh, a huge wind tunnel, a lot of structures facility and a material testing facility. Unfortunately, we do not have uh, a shooting range facilities, uh, but it's not really a problem because uh, I, do not, I do not perform a ballistic test every day. It's something that I try to do one or two times uh, every year. And so I go to a specific uh, ballistic test range. Just a few words about the funding and uh, why it is important, just to show you that our main funding are from private. We receive very few funds from our state, so we um, we work a lot to earn funds from private, from public entities, uh, from European entities, from European project. Uh, and so all, so the most of our research are, uh, let's say, driven by this uh, uh, funding. So it means that the most of my work is to found solution for actual problems. Uh, unfortunately, we have very few space to make uh, um, a, a research at a lower technology readiness. So we try to solve actual problem for industry or for institution. Uh, I work inside uh, a research team. If you are interested, you can also see the website that is uh, this. 
and uh, uh, this research team is called Sigma Lab. It's a research team in which uh, there is several research line. I'm responsible for one of the research line. Uh, we work um, uh, in defining innovative engineering approach for the assessment, new design, optimization of mechanical aerospace, but also energy. Uh, in the last year, I've also worked for innovative drilling technique, just, uh, just, to, just to mention. And we have a lot of collaboration all over the world. Uh, so this is very interesting. This is very stimulating. This is very challenging because um, every day we have a new challenge, a new problem to solve. Uh, focusing on my research topic, um, I am the head of the research line Structural Integrity Under Extreme Load. What is extreme load? Extreme is all but uh, the normal load. So it means all but what is normal, what is covered by the, the common standard, by the common procedure. In this extreme load, in the last 10 years, uh, I devoted a lot of energy in impact, low velocity and high velocity impact. So this is the reason for which uh, I had, I gained several experience in, uh, in this, uh, in this field. How I work in this field? As you can imagine, when you have to face something extraordinary, something extreme, every time is new. It means that you have to create a common framework. Otherwise, every time you have to start by scratch. So during this year, we have refined the this sort of framework, let's say that is not original, but is a framework that uh, works fine. So allow us to, to deliver solution to the problem that we faced. And the, let's say that the, the interesting part of this framework is the triangle that you see in the center. It means that we believe that experimental tests are very important. We devote a lot of efforts in doing experimental tests, but we believe that also numerical, analytical, in general terms, predictive modeling is very, very, very important. I devote the most of my research time in creating modeling approaches. And of course, in validating the modeling approaches. Let me say that when you have a models and when you have a test, so you have one and one, the sum is something more than two because you can uh, learn a lot from the combination of the choose of this numeric of the modeling approach and experimental test. In this scenario, as you can imagine, material mechan the mechanical properties of the material are very, very important because when you go behind the normal loading condition, you uh, need to investigate in the response of the, mat of the material in this extreme loading condition. And so we devoted in the last year a lot of efforts in uh, defining material modeling and Cali calibration. The results uh, is a sort of framework that allow for the for um, realize virtual tests, design optimization, structural health monitoring, fitness for purpose in general. Another things that uh, we use, especially for composite material, is uh, the building block approach. <clears throat> what I mean is that. Uh, especially for composite material, but also for metal, also for ceramic, is not straightforward to investigate directly in the final, pro in the final problem that you have. It's better to create an approach in which you start from coupons, so you start from the single material, and then little by little you increase the complexity. And in doing this, you also check the transferability of your approach. And this is very, very important. What I mean is that <clears throat> in general terms and what we desire is, for instance, that when you calibrate your material model in the coupon stage, the calibration is valid also to replicate the mechanical behavior of, of more complex component. And this is something that we are working on it. And as you can imagine, this is very, very important because if you warrant that your material calibration at the level of coupon can be extended to higher level, you can save a lot of time and a lot of, of efforts. Of course, in this scenario, the complexity starts from the beginning. For instance, in this case, you can see the 
this numerical model of a composite carbon fiber reinforced plastic in which we are able to replicate exactly the failure pattern of the real specimen. Why is so important this possibility to create predictive methods, analytical, numerical, whatever you want? Because it allows a better understanding of the physical phenomena, a better understanding of the several parameters involved in, in highly nonlinear events like the stream condition, this is crucial. And of course, you can perform virtual tests. Uh, think about, uh, in my experience, uh, I uh, work a lot of time with aerospace work. Uh, what if you have a damage, a catastrophic failure of a part of your aeronautic system, and you want to check what is the residual strength of the other part? So what if you have an, an impact and you want to verify the residual strength? It's something that is not feasible to do by experimental test. And so this is the reason for which once you have uh, a predictive modeling approach validated, you can extrapolate this validation, of course, if you're confident with this, and try to understand in very critical, in very critical situation. Uh, I have also a lot of experience of research activity together with MOD, Italian MOD and the European MOD. So we work a lot in the defense system and also in the defense system, we try to boost this uh, predictive modeling approach because in this way you can you can go in a, in a faster and more reliable way from the requirement to the final product you avoid the, to arrive to the final test and see that the the product does not work fine so you have to repeat entirely the process if you have a reliable predictive method you can reduce the uncertainties and this is especially true for a complex material like composite material or the protection, the armor protection, in which you have the different material that work together. And a lot of time when you make very small change, the final result is completely different. If you have a good predictive modeling approach, you can predict this before to go to the shooting range. How it's possible to do this? Well, first of all, the first ingredient for, for this, let's say, cake is the material. I do not want to enter too much in detail in material because let's say that the, um, this level of, of knowledge of the material is not exactly my competence. My competence is more on the side of the mechanical properties of the material. However, it's important to understand the behavior of the material, the physical behavior of the material. If you work in the armor field. So if you want to, to uh, create a protection against a high velocity impact, at present there are three main class of material used. The metals, high strength metals, cheapest choice. They provide a very good protection. They are very um, efficient in terms of arrest the bullet. The only drawback is that they are very heavy. So you add a lot of weight. And this is something that especially now for aerospace, for, but also for, for terrestrial trans transportation is, is no more possible. If you want to go to lightweight design, or even for protection, for something that I have to resist against an impact condition, you have to move to composite material. Composite material and the mix of composite material and other material, for instance, ceramic. Ceramic is very interesting material. We will see in the final part of the presentation and the most advanced protection now are mainly composed by ceramic and composite, even if still is still, uh, is still now a very important uh, um, material for protection. There are a lot of applications still now for, st till now for steel why composite are the preferred. Uh, first of all, let me say that the composite material by themselves are not the perfect material for protection. Uh, for different reasons. Uh, the most important reason is that if you think about metals, if you think about how metals uh, stop a bullet, uh, you clearly see that uh, the action of the stopping of the bullet is very local. 
So it means that when a metals, a protection in metals stop the bullets, it is affected just in a small part. If you see what happened in a composite protection or in a ceramic composite protection, when they arrest the bullet, you have a failure that is very large. It involves a large quantity of the material, especially if your protection is optimized. So you are using at the limit of the protection. So it means that they stop but you have to use a lot of material and in the most of the case the the surrounding part of the protection uh, has not the same capability to arrest further threat so let's say that composite material is not really the perfect protection but is very light you can fit for the purpose it means that you have a lot of degree of freedom and the reason of the lightness is very simple. If you go, for instance, on the right, the Ashby map, you can see that if you see strengths, for all concerned strengths, you, the composite material have the same strengths of the structural metallic alloy, but with an order of magnitude of density. And you can see also in the lower, on the, in the lower right, a figure that, that show the armor weight from since the beginning to now. And you can see that there is a strong reduction in the, in the relative weight. A, a advanced protection now, if you use composite plus a ceramic, and if you use the best material, you can reduce the weight of 60, 70% with respect of a classical metal. Also for metal, there are some innovative metals. So also for metal, there is some possibility to reduce. But this is just to provide you a, an idea about the possibility offered by the modern protection. <clears throat> Why? <clears throat> uh, composite protection in general terms, when we talk about composite protection, uh, there is the possibility to a misunderstanding. We can consider composite protection made just by fiber reinforced or composite protection uh, with multi-layer. In this presentation, I use uh, composite protection just for fiber reinforced. I use multi-layer when I talk about composite plus other. <clears throat> They allow for a wide choice in the basic material and in, in their assembly. And let me say that if you, choice, if you choose carefully, you can achieve very good results. You can choose the fiber, you can choose the volume fraction with, with respect to the resin, the orientation, the, pre, the pretreatment, the type of the resin, the grade of the resin, the manufacturing, the nanofiller. Now there is also possibility to insert nanofillers. Each of these variables can provide completely different results. Let's say that for one point of view is really beautiful because you can fit your protection from the other point of view is really a nightmare because it means that even if you have a very consolidated protection, something that you know very well, you have done a lot of tests, but you change something very small, the final result could be unpredictable. I had in my experience, in, in my work, this kind of experience. You change something very small and the final result is completely different. So this is one of the reasons for which now we try to boost this predictive modeling approach because the alternative is to do tests, a lot of tests. Few words about uh, the three kind of fibers uh, most used at present uh, in the market of, <clears throat> of protection. Probably the most uh, uh, famous is Kevlar. Kevlar has been invented in 1965 by Stephanie Kolleg, that was uh, a researcher in DuPont. She invented the Kevlar trying to found a fiber able to substitute the use of, uh, of uh, wire group or wire filament, metallic wire filament inside the tire. Uh, she developed a peculiar fiber that was of interest, but very expensive. But from this kind of fiber, they derived the Kevlar. 
The Kevlar was used since the 70s for personal protection. In the middle of the 70s, the National Institute of Justice in USA certified that the Kevlar was a really good material for protection and and since then it exploded in the in the protection market now kevlar you can buy a, a, a vest in kevlar also on internet is quite cheap of course is not uh, not all not all is uh, cert is cert is certified but you can buy whatever you want about Kevlar in internet. And of course, Kevlar has been improved. So uh, year after year, we, are bet we have better fibers with higher strengths, um, better uh, capability to arrest the bullet. The advantage of the Kevlar is that uh, it has a very strength fiber. The fiber is not affected by the heat, so it's not possible to melt. It is used since uh, still till now for in several army tier now is used for the helmet, and you have a lot of degree of freedom when you talk about Kevlar when you talk about protection denery, generally we talk about uh, woven composite, not unidirectional but woven, but even also when you talk about woven, you have several possibility for the um, setup of the wave plain wave one of the most used but probably one of the most efficient is the satin wave the satin wave is very efficient because there is few crimp and this crimp are critical for compression so if you can reduce this you can increase the performance dyneema dyneema very famous very recent um, very expensive, very difficult to manufacture. You have to use a high pressure compression molding. Um, the issue of the Denema, but for the protection is also a pro, is that uh, the melting point is very low. So when you shot against a Denema, you can see that the bullet is sort of encapsulated uh, uh, around the Denema that melt around the bullet. Uh, this is very favorable for the rest. The drawback is that you have a lot of back face. In fact, the, the helmet in Dyneema are affected by problem due to um, an increase of this back face. But from Kevlar to Dyneema, you can reduce about 20%, 25% of the weight. So Dyneema from, from uh, weight reduction is very interesting. And glass, glass fiber are very known, especially for um, structural construction. At present, there are innovative fiber, type S and type R, that have higher strength, higher modulus, significantly lower density. The, one of the interesting aspects of the glass is that it has a very high compressive strength. This is very important, especially for the first part of the impact. And so this is one of the reasons for which now it's interesting to verify the capability of an hybrid composite in which uh, uh, it's possible to alternate the layer of the glass uh, with the Kevlar. So let, as you can see, there is a lot of possibility. Another pro of the glass, but of course is just, uh, um, it just is funny, but it's interesting is that when you shot against a glass fiber, especially in, in the lab, you can see very clearly the delamination because it just, just needs to put a light on the rear. And you can see this beautiful image in which is very easy to catch the delamination. With the other composite is, an, is a nightmare. If you want to see what happened inside, it's, it's not easy. It's, so let's say that it is funny, but it's very useful because it allows to validate uh, your model in a very effective way. I do not want to enter too much in detail in, in, in the other stuff because it's, it's not really my, <coughs> my topic, but of course, but resin, resin is really, really very important because the resin allows the fiber to stay together. And uh, there are several possibilities. Generally, the thermoset are preferred because they are thermal and chemical resistance. Epoxy, phenolic, polyester, vinyl ester, all this fiber are used. 
of course, you have to select the fiber, you have to select the amount of the fiber, the, the resin, you have to select the amount of the resin with respect to the fiber. You have to select the manufacturing process and each manufacturing process have a final, let's say, um, condition of, 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 your, of your plate, of your manufacture. So as you can see, there is a lot of degree of freedoms. Now, uh, two of the most used process are the prepeg layout or the vacuum resin transfer molding. These are very used and they allow to create a very, very good manufacture with pro and cons. Now, and we, we can enter more in detail in what is my uh, research, what is my work. Ballistic testing. I'm not an expert in ballistic, really in ballistic testing, because as I told you, I do twice in the year ballistic testing, but I need to uh, design my ballistic testing in a proper way because uh, I have very few possibilities to do ballistic testing. And so I need to get from the test the most of the interesting results. What are at present the most uh, famous ballistic testing and what are the tests that in my opinion are useful for uh, my research purpose? Let's say that, uh, as I told you, you have a lot of uh, um, variability when you build the protection, you have a lot of variability when you do ballistic test because ballistic test is not just an impactor that uh, go against your plate, but is an impactor that start uh, is run in a barrel, then interact with the air and then arrive to your plate. So you have the so-called internal ballistic, the external ballistic, and then the terminal ballistic a lot of variability in the internal and in, in external. So you have a lot of uncertainties also in this test. So you can clearly understand that, especially for the purpose of certification, of the purpose of, uh, um, of buy, of purchase, uh, some protection that is fitted for the purpose, you need uh, some test and you need to trust to, to this test. So this is the reason for which in, in the latter 20, 30 years, several standards for the test arise, civil standard and military standard. The standard are not for research. The standard are to assess the capability of a protection with respect to a, a, a threat. The most famous, <coughs> especially for civil, is the um, National Institute of Justice, the NIJ 0101.06. That is the standard for the assessment of the personal vest against the civil threat. Let's say not, not, not really the civil, but the small to medium, but medium small caliber. Then there are similar tests in, all, in several nations. There is also a very similar test in European standard and there are of course military tests. Uh, let's focus a little bit on the, on the NIJ standards. Why it is important? For basically for two reasons. One, because this standard provide you a clear setup for the test. Uh, it is not straightforward because as I told you, the bullet before to arrive to your panel has a very long story. So in, from this standard, even if the final result is very simple, so this picture, uh, you have a clear idea about what is the distance from the gun to the target and what is the distance at which you can put the sensor in order to acquire the exact impact velocity. Uh, this is not trivial. Let's say that I'm not talking about gas gun in which uh, the bullet uh, is rigidly connected to a saboy, it, it, it arrives in a very clear way to, the, to your panel. I'm talking about a real gun, something uh, real that uh, replicates exactly what happened at the, in the actual world. <coughs> 
another interesting aspect of this standard is the um, description of the possible threat. Also, this is very interesting because you can see that you can range from the nine millimeter Luger that even if uh, it's something small, it's something widespread. So it's a very, it's, it's a very dangerous, even if it's small, to the three, to the three, five, seven, to the three, five, seven manium, to the 7.62. 7.62 is a rifle. And uh, um, the standard um, consider both the ball, that is uh, the standard for, for the most of, of the military rifle, but also the armor piercing, that is a very dangerous bullet. <coughs> I do not want her too much in detail in this uh, uh, testing them because uh, in most of the case, I'm not interested in assessing the capability of a vest. What I use in my test are the rules that I show you before. So the selection of the type of the threat because this type of the threat uh, are significant for the level of the energy, for the level of the threat. And so it's interesting to select a threat according to this table. And when I go to the shooting range, I ask for this specific setup. But if you are interested in the standard, you can download it freely. The standard provide you all the rules in order to accept a life vest. It is interesting that it is not just required that you have no penetration with several impact, but it is also required that you have a limited back fake signature because it's not just important to arrest, it's important to have limited trauma. Another uh, Another standard is the EN 1522, that is the European standard, very similar for several aspects to the NIJ. The setup is the same and also the bullet are the same. So uh, we tend to use these two tables in order to select the threat. Uh, you can see here the a, a slice of the bullet. And we use uh, these slides in order to create models of the bullets because, um, as you can imagine, if you want to create a modeling approach to designer protection, you need to create a modeling approach uh, to uh, create uh, an, uh, a virtual an avatar of the bullet in, in your uh, um, simulating environment. And let's say that it is very complex because you have to replicate exactly the bullet after the technological process. So in the last year, we have devoted several approaches. The first one is to cut the bullet. The second is to catch the mechanical properties of the material of the bullet exactly on the bullet itself. So after the technological process. It's not straightforward. You need a, a micro in, indentation and the inverse method te technique but the final results are really, really, really good because you get exactly the mechanical property of the bullet during the impact. This is more or less what you have. So you have a, in, um, a sensor that allows to catch the impact velocity, then you have the target, and then another sensor that allows to catch the residual velocity. Why this? Because I'm interested in create a predictive modeling approach. I'm not interested in just see what happened when you arrest the bullet. This is one of the case, but I'm interested in creating a predictive approach that uh, consider all the, um, all the possible um, uh, impact condition, also the residual velocity. And what you get is a curve like this, in which you have a residual velocity as a function of impact velocity. As you can see, there is a sort of straight behavior for high velocity, and then there is a sudden drop close to the um, ballistic limit. The ballistic limit, generally, the catching the ballistic limit, you can catch this value that is very important using two main approach, or this is what I try to do. Uh, 
what I do in the most of the case is to catch the ballistic limit using this curve. So you have a point from experimental test and you build the curve. This curve is the Lambert Jonas or the Rick Ipson. In the common jargon, these two curves tend to mix up. Even if the Lambert Jonas equation approximates this curve, uh, with uh, several degree of freedom. So you have both the parameter A, both the parameter P, and both the VBL, that is the ballistic limit, that are free. So you, can op you have to optimize this parameter in order to fit the, the point. In the Rec Ipsilon, P is set to two. That means that, that the energy absorbed by the, by the target it, it is always the same. <laughs> And so you can clearly understand that if the energy absorbed by the tar is always the same, is you can understand that there is this sudden drop because the energy is uh, at the power of the velocity. And so when you approximate the ballistic limit, uh, the, the velocity, the, the energy decreases, but at the power of the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the velocity itself. And so you have this sudden drop. And A is a ratio between the mass. Let's say that in the most of the case, we use the Lambert Jonas, but we called it the Rec Ipsilon. There is another method to catch the ballistic limit that this, it is used for the military standard. Uh, the method is to consider the ballistic limit as the minimum velocity at which a, a projectile is expected to completely penetrate the armor or the maximum velocity at which a projectile, a projectile is expected to fail the penetrate armor. What it means? It means that you do a lot of tests. So you do the in sort of up and down firing in between the ballistic limit. So in some way you know in a very approximate way what is the ballistic limit and then you do this up and down. In doing this up and down, what you get is a curve, a probability curve, probability curve of penetration like this. There are three points of interest. The V0, so you have zero probability of penetration. The V100, you have 100 probability of penetration. But as you can imagine, these points are very critical because this point lie in a zone of probability that is flat. So it means that it's very difficult to catch exactly the V0 of the V100. So there's our theoretical value. What is easy is the famous V50. In the most of the case, you see that the V50 is. The V50 is the velocity at which you have the 50% of probability to penetrate. So, is, and it is easier because in this case, if you move at a little bit higher velocity, you have a complete penetration. If you move at a slower, at a lower velocity, you have an, an arrest because the probability curve in this place is very, very steep. So this is the reason for which in the most of the case, the V50 is the required data. But I'm not interested in V50 because V50 requires a lot of bullet, a lot of tests, and at the end, you have just one data that taking account of the uncertainties of the bullet. But in my numerical model, it's very difficult to replicate all these uncertainties. So I prefer the Rec Ipsilon. I pay with a little less, uh, let's say, confidence in the data, but I have more point and I have point close to arrest or in the passage zone. Or in the passage zone. Let me say then, <coughs> experimental tests, however, are very important because allow a better understanding of the phenomenon, but are very expensive. <laughs> Trust me, at really, really very expensive, a lot of variability, different to change configuration. If you, if you trust just on the experimental test at the final part of, of your design process and there is something that does not work fine, it's difficult to, to come back. And in my case, the experimental tests are very frantic because when I do in shooting range, I have a lot of tests, very, very uh, short time. I have to do all in the, in the better way in a short time and they are very, very, very frantic. 
Of course, there are also tests for material characterization. We have a strong collaboration with Professor Sandro, but these are more standard, and I know I do not want to talk about you on this. Now we can go to the main course, numerical modeling. What is possible to do for creating predictive modeling approach? Uh, there are two, <clears throat> two big family for predictive approach. One is analytical models. Analytical models is made, for instance, in my case, that you create MATLAB routine. MATLAB routine, which you selected the most important physics of the impact and you try to replicate. This is a very interesting exercise for two reasons. One, you have to understand very clearly what are the physical behind each material and each material or each combination of material behave differently. You have to clearly understand this physics and you have to replicate by mathematical modeling. The results <coughs> in some cases are very accurate. For some composite, for some metals are incredibly accurate. And once you have spent time to create this model, the results are very fast. So uh, I really propose a lot numeric analytical model to my customer, especially in the first phase of the design of a protection, because in few days uh, you can select the most promising uh, combination of material. We are also developing automatic um, automatic process for optimization with analytical models. On the contrary, numerical models are more general. They allow to, re to replicate more physics. They allow to replicate more details about the phenomena, but each model costs a lot and the running of each model costs a lot. So let's say, let me say that very good numerical models are more virtual tests. So you replicate the test by the numerical approach. What is important to replicate in the modeling approach, in the numerical modeling approach? Well, we want to replicate the actual world. So we have to see what happened. In the actual world, we have failure during an impact when we, when we arrest or when a bullet pass through our protection, we have failure. We have fiber breakage under tensile loading. Of course, this is most, mostly the case in which you have passage, but it is also the case in which your bullet barely pass. You have the tearing of the fiber in the back face of your plate. You have fiber kinking and under compressive, compressive loading. There is the possibility that the kink, remember before when I talk about plane wave a certain way, I talk about this possible kink. This kink may be um, increased due to compressive load. <clears throat> And then you have the failure of the matrix that is also important because if you lose the matrix, you lose a lot of possibility to absorb energy because consider that each of these failure means energy absorption. So you have the possibility to absorb energy due to matrix cracking in time side, but also due to compressive and shear loading. And finally, you have the lamination. The lamination is not uh, the most absorbing energy phenomena in, in, an, in a high velocity impact, but it is important. And this is, most, this is more important in low velocity impact in which you have the so-called barely visible damage. In ballistic impact, you have not a problem to have barely visible because all the damage are clearly visible. But of course, the lamination is another phenomenon. All these phenomena act inside a um, ballistic impact. At the beginning, when the bullet penetrates inside the penetration channel, you have crashing and transverse shear. So it is important that the, the cutting, the cutting capability of the fiber, uh, so it, sorry, it, um, it means that it, uh, um, this crushing and transverse shear act on the cutting capability of the fiber. Then you have the compression. Uh, the compression is driven by the low modulus or by the low volume fracture of, of the fiber. Let's say that there are also cases in which uh, these two are the unique 
energy absorption mechanism activated. If you see the right image in which the bullet has been stopped uh, in, in a very um, in the first layer of your composite, you can see that just the crushing, transfer, compression, and a very small delamination have been activated. Let's say that, however, this is not an optimal solution because as you can see, there is a lot of material that does not work. So the protection on the right is not really optimized. If your bullet move further, you have also the conical deformation. The conical deformation and the transmission of kinetic energy from the bullet to this conical deformation is the most important energy absorption mechanism. Uh, we found this by the analytical modeling approach. We found this creating analytical model approach, we discovered this. Then of course you have the lamination that are driven by the metrics. And finally, if the bullet arrive to the, to the last layer, you may have tensile failure. <coughs> So these are the mechanisms, and you have to replicate this mechanism. How it poss how is possible to do this? Well, you have two possibilities according to my experience. One is created a macro scale uh, modeling approach. So is a modeling approach in which uh, you create an homogeneous continuous that replicate your composite with equivalent mechanical process that is the most used or a mesoscale approach. <coughs> the mesoscale approach, as you can see, you create the fabric, you create, you model the fabric itself. What is the best? Well, there are pros and cons. Uh, the macro scale is very simple to model, allow to create complex geometries, relatively low computational cost, no characterization of the unit cell, but you pay a lot in the material modeling because you have to replicate all the failure condition that you have seen before in an homogeneous environment. So you have to create a very complex material model able to replicate all the failure condition. So you have extensive material characterization and calibration. The mesoscale is exactly the contrary. Complex modeling, complex geometry, high computational cost, but the material modeling is really, really, really very simple. And when I tell you simple, I mean simple. Elastic, elastic, because both the fiber and the matrix, in the most of the case, if you analyze by themselves, they are brittle. The elastic behavior, the plasticity that you see during the impact is due to the micro fracture, the micro, um, due, due to the fact that you have a lot of micro fracture in the matrix, in the single filaments, and this behavior, this progressive behavior, create the plastic-like behavior that you appreciate. But the single material are, so from the material point of view, they are extremely easy. On the contrary, the homogeneous is a nightmare. It's a nightmare because you have very complex material in an homogeneous environment in which you have a sort of marmalade. You have to replicate the failure of the fiber and the failure of the matrix. And of course, the failure between the different layer. But this is something common also for the mesoheterogeneous. Uh, just a very brief overview about the material models that we are currently use, using in my research team. The easiest material 54 based on Chang Chang, um, it, is, it, is a, it is a good material, it is quite simple. The drawback of this material is that it's not possible to add a proper, let's say, uh, post damage behavior. The behavior of this material is quite brittle. It fell in a brittle fashion. So it's good if you have very huge structure because this material is very light from computational point of view and uh, you have very limited failure. So in this case, this material is fine. 
otherwise you have to move to more complex material material 58 sorry i um, i miss the fact that uh, these are material available in a specific code numerical code that is ls dyna uh, this material 58 is based on the ashing failure criteria and on the work of Matt Miller. What is the advantage of this work? The advantage of this work is that this material increases the complexity of the calibration because provide you with more degree of freedom, especially in the post damage. By means of the parameter slim and the roads, you can tune the material behavior. But the big issue is that you have to tune the material behavior. So it, it means that in the most of the case, these parameters are not really physical, are numerical. So this parameter strongly depend on the material, strongly depend on the mesh. And you have to tune, you have to do several tests, you have to, numerical tests that replicate an experimental one, and you have to tune by parametric analysis this material till you reach the result of the experimental. What is the pros is that we are verifying that there is a transferability of the result. So it means that when you calibrate tune, this parameter, you then can move this parameter to a higher level. Then we are using uh, another material that is very interesting, material 162. I do not want to enter too much in the detail of, of this parameter, just to show you the complexity of this parameter. You have 34 parameters to calibrate. So you can imagine that it is really a nightmare, the calibration of these parameters. During the last four years, we have spent a lot of time in defining a procedure because it's not possible every time that you have a new material to, to start by scratch. So now we have a procedure that allow us to calibrate step by step the parameter. In this calibration, the parameter AM1234 are solely numerical parameter. The manual itself of the material tell you they are just numerical. You have to calibrate just by trial and error. But the final results are, are encouraging. So we spend a lot of time, but of course the final results are very, very good. Um, these materials allow also to calibrate the strain rate effect because another nightmare of the composite material is that the composite material are strain rate dependent. They suffer about the strain rate. I don't know exactly the physical, the chemical, the physical cause of this, but uh, they are in most of the case, they depend in a not negligible way from the strain rate. You can see in this graph the normalized dynamic strength and modulus. And you can see that there is a factor of 1.7 from 0 to 1000 over second. Let's say that 1000, even if the, the slope of the curve at 1000 is quite flat, but 1000 is a very low level of strain rate. When you move to ballistic impact, you can arrive to 10,000, 20,000. So the effect of the strain rate is really, really important. Uh, there is another possibility inside the material 162, material 162 <coughs> take care also of the delamination itself, uh, but uh, it is more a drawback than a pros. Because another important aspect is that when you use this kind of materials, you have to select a sort of continuum damage in order to have a decay of the mechanical, um, mechanical properties of the material and then you have to select another level in which you erase the element. The removal of the element is very critical because when you remove the element, you remove something that is energy because it's mass, so it's energy, and something that in the real world, in some way, 
may be useful for a compression. So the removal of the N of the of an element is very, very tricky. And we have to take care about this when you do such kind of analysis. And then another very recent material that we are using is very complex. So I, I avoid any too much technical explanation is the PUC failure criteria. What is the most interesting aspect of the PUC failure criteria is that the PUC failure criteria, even if is an homogeneous, so let's say a phenomenological criteria, it is very physical in describe the fracture plane of the matrix. So it allows to describe the behavior of your homogeneous layer, taking account that the there is uh, a fracture plane of failure of the of of the matrix. I I skip this formulation because they are not interesting. Another aspect interesting of the PUC criteria is that it allows to consider a nonlinear behavior in case of pure shear stress and consider failure energies. This is, let's say, important because in the other material you have failure strengths or other kind of failure that are related to the specific size of the mesh. If you use energy, you can in some way remove the mesh dependency. So PUC criteria is very useful. The, drawback, the big drawback of PUC criteria is that at present is not implemented in any software. So you have to create your own routine. We have created an own routine on Abacus. Let's say that I have a PhD student that is one year that is working creating this routine. So it's a very complex matter, but the results are very, very good. Let's say what happened when you, can, when you have a, a unidirectional um, material, in this case is a carbon fiber um, coupon created by laminating unidirection. You can see the difference between experimental numerical PUC and material 162. Let's say that material 162 is at present the state of the art of the composite material for impact engineering. We replicate not just the curve, but also the failure pattern is very important. Also in this case, that is uh, the balanced laminate. In the previous case was the shear, in this case is the balanced laminate. So the PUC criteria is very interesting. Very finally, before to finish this discussion about the material, you have to take care about what happened between the different lamina. Because even for the mesoterogeneous, you, you join together different lamina and this, this laminas may detach and you have the delamination. How it's possible to model the delamination? At present, uh, you have several possibilities. One is the cohesive element, so other elements, other um, material property that you have cali calibrated. So it's again, not straightforward or the cohesive surface. The advantage of the cohesive surface is that the cohesive elements are element, so very thin, and the uh, um, computational cost is driven by this very thin element. When you have cohesive surface, you at least uh, do not affect the computational cost. General terms, the cohesive surface are also known as tie break, so it's also possible to create the tie and uh, in a specific condition having a break. Uh, you can select a cohesive behavior or just simply a break. Very finally, just to mention that uh, you have built your models, you have calibrated your mechanical properties, you are very happy, you uh, press run and then your analysis became crazy. Why? Because you have hourglass problem. Because in the most of the case, uh, in order to re reduce the computational cost, uh, you, uh, we use uh, um, um, element uh, with uh, one uh, 
um, integration node. So it means that we use element that may be affected by hourglass. Uh, this is a common approach because you use very small element in order to reduce the computational cost, you use element with just one, de one node for the calculation of the stress. You can uh, deal with hourglass by several methods also in this case, you have to do a lot of tests because the manuals provide you some advice, but when you do research, you are in a, in a path that is a path of unknown. And so you have to try what is the best method and you have always to check this graph that is the graph of the energy and check that the energy due to the hourglass, so the energy that is inserted in the system in order to reduce the hourglass modeling is low. Otherwise, you get results, but these results are rubbish, are not, not useful. So now you can run analysis. So you have characterized, you have your experimental test, and now you can run your model and verify how this model works. So let's, uh, let's see now some example. So let's see now what we are, some relevant example according to my research. First of all, you have to calibrate it. Just a few words about how it's possible to calibrate the mechanical behavior of the material. We use inverse method. So it means that we replicate also the, um, the specimen, the, the tensile test and the other test. And we calibrate the mechanical behavior of the material in order to replicate by numerical model, even the tensile test. Also at this level, you can use the macro-homogeneous or the meso-heterogeneous. Remember that the meso-heterogeneous is, is very simple. It's just an elastic. But if you see the outcome, so if you see the dot, the dot line, the dot black line with respect to the blue line, you can see that the dot black line in some way is able to replicate the fluctuation of the experimental. Why this fluctuation? Because you, when you stretch your coupon, you start to fail um, the, the matrix, then uh, your uh, woven start to change a little bit the geometry. And so you have a behavior that is not exactly linear. But when you use the, an homogeneous, the homogeneous require just an average elastic module. So the, ma the macro homogeneous is just a line. So you can, you can start to understand why we spend a lot of time in mesoheterogeneous because since the beginning, it allowed to better provide, it allowed to provide better results. Then, of course, we have to do the same with the bullet because also the bullet deforms a lot. So if you want to replicate exactly what happened, especially close to the ballistic limit in which the bullet is, especially the bullet with the soft core, lead core, are blunt and are extremely deformed, is really, really important uh, to, to calibrate. So we use uh, modified Johnson Cook, use crocker flatten criteria. And then finally, you can build your model. Generally for woven, we build the model with symmetry. Pay attention that is not possible with unidirectional, but with woven, it's possible to build model with symmetry. Some example, in this case, we test a Kevlar 129 plain wind fabric with epoxy matrix. 6.5 millimeter, 357 manium, FB3 class, according to EN. Speed 443 is the nominal speed of, of the bullet. What we get? We get experimentally this behavior. The, the curve is perfect. If you see the approximation of the, of the Lambert Jonas or like Ipsom, is really perfect on, on the point. Of course, it's very difficult to catch a point exactly in the ballistic limit. This is the reason for which the ballistic limit using the Lambert Jonas and the Rec Ipsom is built just using the, the um, the shot with a residual velocity and neglecting the shot arrested. And we replicate by the numerical model. We use material 162. We did very 
uh, a lot of calibration of the, param of the softening parameters. What you see on the left is the one element analysis. We do a lot of one element analysis. If you want to understand how a material model behave, just test with one element. You, you, remo you uh, remove all the complexity of different elements, just one element. Test what happened when you apply a load to one element, load tension or shear. <coughs> and you can understand what is the effect of the different parameter. On the right, you can see what are the effects of changing one parameter on the Rec Ipsum curve. So as you can see, just one parameter, just small variation with, re with regard to the range of this parameter, you have a, a very strong variation in the outcome of of the, of the curve. You can optimize the parameter. You can see in the red the parameter according to literature, in the blue the parameter that we have fitted by ourselves. Let's say that we fit just the fictitious parameter, not the physical one. We, of course, we cannot fit the elastic modulus or other parameter. We fit the fictitious parameter, the parameter expressly created to tune the material model. Another important aspect is the strain rate dependent or strain rate independent material. So as you can see, there is a, a strong difference if you use a, a meso-heterogeneous model, strain rate dependent is the blue one or strain rate independent. Pay attention that in the previous slide, we were talking about macro homogeneous in this slide we were talking about meso heterogeneous so this is the model with the fiber and and the matrix and you can see that if you add the effect of the dependence on the strain rate the results are incredibly incredibly better this is the best results that we achieve so uh, the red one, uh, uh, sorry, the black one is the experimental, the red one is the macro homogeneous, and the blue one is the meso heterogeneous model. What are the differences? Remember that the macro homogeneous is uh, in the figure in the lower right, uh, what you have on the left. So each ply is an homogeneous, the meso heterogeneous each ply is composed by the fiber and by the filament. As you can see, the mesoheterogeneous allow for a better description of what happened. You can describe the detachment of the matrix. You can better describe the detachment of the single, of the single, of the single wire. Another example is a Kevlar with. A 12 layer. As you can see, uh, in this case, I want just to see the, the importance of the bullet. So in this case, we use a macro homogeneous approach, but we devoted a lot of efforts in modeling the mechanical behavior of the bullet. And the final result was really, really very good. But also the final results according to the bullet, because we catch, uh, we retrieve a bullet arrested. So we are in a case of fully arrested. And you can see clearly below on the left, the actual bullet and on the right, the bullet that we are able to simulate. So uh, when we create uh, models that are very close to the experimental one, I mean both the plate and the bullet itself. Another interesting activity that we performed is how to correctly calibrate the strain rate behavior of a material because a lot of time is very complex because you have the strain rate of the single constituent but not the strain rate of the macro homogeneous. So we create a, a representative volume element of in this case of glass fiber. This representative volume element of the glass fiber was fitted with the mechanical behavior of the material, the glass and the matrix around, uh, including the strain rate. And so we were able to calibrate the strain rate effect of the equivalent one. 
So we calibrated the strain rate effect of the macromogenius starting from the mesoheterogeneous. And the result was really very good because if you consider the strain rate dependent homogeneous material, you can get exactly what happened in the real test. You can get an arrest of the bullet when the bullet is arrested. Otherwise, for the strain rate independent, you cannot have arrest. For instance, you can see in the, in the picture at the velocity of about 400 meters per second that for strain rate, uh, for strain rate independent, uh, you do not have uh, arrest. For strain rate dependent and for experimental, you have arrest. You catch exactly the shape of the failure. You, you catch exactly the delamination. So this is a very good result. I work a lot also for the European and for, for um, European Defense Agency. We have a lot of project. This was a project related to define an impact monitoring for UAV, and I was responsible for the numerical module for the for the damage estimation. In this case. It was carbon fiber reinforced plastic unidirectional. We use PUC and we use material 162 in order to replicate the impact of this material against a bullet. You can see that the, the, in the abacus, there is the PUC criteria, in the LS Dyna, there is the material 162. And the results are not exactly the same. Even if material 162 is considered at present the state of the art of the material for composite in case of impact, the results are pretty different. And if you move to the damage, you can see that the PUC criteria is able to better describe the delamination because PUC criteria is very focused in describing the failure of, of the matrix. Of course, PUC criteria is very complex because it requires a, a, a subroutine. Very finally, so be patient, a few minutes, I will talk about uh, a, a multi-layer protection. Multi-layer protection, uh, it means that you put several layers. You can put uh, also composite, but you can, you can put metal composite. But when you talk about uh, multi-layer, generally we talk about something in which the first layer is ceramic. Why ceramic? Because ceramic is very hard. Uh, it allowed to erode, to fracture, uh, and to dissipate the energy by fragmentation. It is very important that the so-called dwell time, in which it is the time in which the bullet stay in the contact with the ceramic. In this time, the energy is, is, uh, is passed from the bullet to the ceramic, and meantime, the bullet is eroded. After you pass the energy from the bullet to the ceramic, you create a conoid. This conoid is very large and you can absorb the energy of this conoid by a backing. And in this case, the composite material is the preferred choice. This is an interesting um, research that we did together with Professor Sander with different type of of uh, uh, ceramic and different, uh, um, and uh, uh, sorry, with one type of, of, of ceramic, but a different type of baking. So we, we try the effect of the baking, as you can see with the 13 millimeters, uh, with the, the um, sorry, 13 plus one layers of Kevlar epoxy, we have no rest, but uh, with 18 layers, we have a rest. So we replicate this in our numerical environment. What is um, our experience in this case is not to go straight to the assembly, but to analyze a little bit the two materials separately. We have experience in composite, we gain experience in ceramic by doing impact tests on the bare ceramic. Impact tests on bare ceramic are very rare. If you go to the literature, you found very few papers. Um, I'm, and 
let's say that one of these papers is, is the paper that we uh, we wrote uh, because doing an impact against ceramic uh, bare ceramic is very complex because at the end what what you get is a lot of of debris so you have to create the test environment in a very specific way in order to get a lot of results that allow you to use the result to calibrate uh, your models at any rate we create models uh, i do not want, want to enter too much in the detail about uh, eroding contact but there are a lot of contacts as you can imagine when you have a multi-layer the big issue is that you have a lot of contact especially if you consider that the ceramic create a lot of debris all this debris maybe may go in contact with the composite so it's very complex for a numerical point of view is very expensive it's very expensive we create a model for the bullet. It's really important to have a deformable bullet with the correct mechanical properties because uh, the strategy of the protection to arrest the bullet is to deform the bullet, to erode the bullet. So we have to simulate this. For the ceramic, we use the johnson Holmquist criteria. Is the John is a model is a material model in which there is a strength that depend on the damage that occurred to the element and at each step, this damage is um, um, calculated and so the strength of the of the material is reduced step by step. And it's very very important to be able to replicate the fragmentation well uh, there are several possibilities in this research we um, select the possibility of the removal of the element so it means that we define a criterion the, the criterion that we choose what the fatty plastic strain in the ceramic and when this specific criterion has been met, we remove a small element of the ceramic. This is one of the possibilities, but it is not a unique. For instance, now in this, this, in, in this mounts, we are working with meshless approach. We are working with SPH, with peridynamics that are local approach, but without the mesh. Our approach in which each element is a particle that interacts and so there is no need to remove in order to create fragmentation but in that case we use the removal we optimize the point of removal by the test so we use the test on the single uh, tile of ceramic in order to optimize the mechanical property of the ceramic and then we create the full model the results was really good because for instance for the placa 6 placa six for these styles in which we barely reach a penetration he also in the numerical model we reach something very very similar with the tearing of the fiber in, in the last part but without a penetration and you can see here the results of our model we create also analytical model um, we improve the analytical model and as you can see we are able in the numerical model to replicate the exact the numerical model is the green one the, um, the star is the experimental one we are able to replicate exactly what happened just uh, 30 seconds what we are doing now because what i show you is what we did what we are doing now just to, to to tell you stay tuned hybrid composite we have a very interesting collaboration with professor sandro stay tuned nano composite it's it's a mess because i i show you what is difficult with composite imagine when you put inside something that is really really nano glass and SPH and peridynamics coatings. These are very interesting and very promising research activities in the ballist. I finish with two thanks. One to Professor Sandro for the great collaboration and the invitation. Those are pictures taken a few years ago when we are together in a shooting in a shooting range with my colleague. And of course, a special thanks to my research team because we did 
we, uh, I present a lot because my research team and not just me do a lot. Thank you. That's, a, that's excellent. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Andre. You, you, the, you, you passed a little the time, but I didn't want to cut to cut to very interesting and everything. <laughs> thank and you. I had many much. questions here, so <laughs> I'm going to try to to run this this questions. I mean, in a fast kind of way. If you if you if you if you, if you bear with me, I'm going to ask you a few questions. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I have time. I have time. Okay. <laughs> no problem. Right. I have time. <laughs> so I have nine questions here. Let's see how we, how we can uh, how we can run this. Okay, does modeling take into account the changes in velocity of the projectile, the matrix, and reinforcement as it travels through the composites? Did you show anything about this, right? About the changing velocity of the projectile as it travels through yeah. them? Definitely, definitely, definitely uh, this. You can, no, okay, uh, this is the energy, but of course the energy in some ways, velocity and, and mass. You can see for instance, turn rate independence, turn rate dependent, this is the energy of the, of the bullet. So of course uh, we can take care about the velocity, both in the numerical and in the analytical, analytical modeling. So we know exactly in each instant and in each point of the penetration channel, what is the velocity of the bullet and the state of the bullet. Okay, okay, great. Okay, second one is, can you estimate the percentage of energy uh, observation of the various fracture mo models? How much energy goes to each fracture um, uh, mode? Sorry, uh, fracture modes, not modes. Yeah, fracture yeah. Mode. Uh, it's a very good question, but it is difficult to answer because it depends on the type of impact. If you have a, a complete arrest, if you have a passage. What I can tell you is that if you have a, a, in, an arrest, uh, the crashing and the compression take the most of the energy. If you have a passage, the conical deformation, it means that, that there is a, in, a, a kinetic energy that the bullet transfer to the panel and this is a conical deformation, conical velocity deformation. Mm -hmm. And this is the most of the energy. Okay. But the model doesn't, doesn't separate which energy with no, no, definitely, definitely, definitely. The model separate. If you are interested, I've, I've wrote several articles about analytical modeling of impact. And in this article, there are the graph for each condition of all this type of energy, because the analytical model of composite are based on energy absorption. Okay, great, great. We've got one other one here. Have you considered FEMO? finite element model of dating to calibrate our parameters. It is an effective approach to calibrate models with unknown input parameters. It's, Sorry, I missed the need then. The FEMU, -E finite element model of dating. That's a one. No, uh, no, very interesting. Uh, I take note about this. Uh, uh, no, but as I told you, there are, uh, what I show you is, is what I what, what I know and, and what I what I did, uh, but there are several other possibilities, uh, other to, possibilities to do similar work. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna skip this one and go to the next one. Okay, there's a suggestion here to implement Kant failure criteria into your model. It is derived from Cook based on invariance and equally and is equally effective, and it can be implemented in Python. Yeah, we are uh, we are still working in in PUC criteria. So PUC criteria is uh, work work in in progress. So there is a lot of work to do. Yeah. Okay. The next one here is: Do you think the rifling motion of the projectile affects the ballistic properties of the composite? Rifling. I motion. think that it means the total yield probably. Uh, because the bullet, when the bullet impact, uh, it has what is called a total yaw. Uh, yeah, definitely yes, because uh, uh, we have experience um, that there is a strong variation. Of course, uh, the normal impact may be the, 
uh, an approach, but with such kind of model, you can do whatever you want. You can simulate whatever you want. So you can simulate an angled impact or mm -hmm. an impact with an yo angle that are different, are different. Because they, they, the yo, it means that you go straight, but you have an angle. An angled impact, it means that you go angled. It's, it is possible to simulate. But the, the, the experimental always tries to go 90 degrees, right? The experimental, experimental yeah, yeah. The, the picture the that I show you yeah. uh, for uh, this picture, yeah. it's simple. But if you use this distance, uh, you and uh, of course, if the bullet is fine, uh, the rifle is fine, uh, it is supposed that the bullet is stabilized before to impact. Okay, fine. Okay, and a tricky one here. What's the role of the interface between the phases between fiber and matrix in the numerical model and ballistic analysis? The role of the adhesion between fiber and matrix in uh, the numerical model? The law. The law of the vision, yeah. Uh, the role, the role, the, the, the role. I mean, how, how important is the interface and how you Okay, okay. Uh, for? It's really important. It's really important because if you think about uh, uh, the heterogeneous model, in the heterogeneous model, you have to join uh, each element of the fiber to each element of the matrix. And uh, the fail of this interaction is what provides the nonlinear behavior. So it is really, really important. Yeah. But I remember that we we've, we've done some experimental tests to try to 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 try not to to, to calculate actually to measure the, this energy right in the interface. So so this could be, could be put into the into the model, right? Yeah, but yeah, but there are two kind of interface. One is the interface between the layer, the the so-called delamination. And the other is the contact between uh, the fiber, fiber and the matrix. Yeah, this question is also, was about the fiber and the matrix. The, the fiber and the matrix. Matrix. Both are really, really very important, yeah. All right, next one here. Could you please show again the alternative method to V50 test from the MIL standard 6662F and explain the, the advantage of the first one over the second one? Yeah, yeah, sure. yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, just to found okay uh, the ad okay the uh, the military standard is a standard that is was born in order to uh, to certify a protection so you want that the protection is able to rest a specific threat at a specific velocity that's all due to the fact that it is very complex to obtain the v0 because of course from the side of the people that is protected, you want the V0, you want to, to assure that there is no penetration. To do the fact that it is very difficult, generally they start calculating the V50. This is fine. But for my perspective of creating a model, I'm more interested in this approach in which you have both the possibility data. to calculate yeah, the ballistic limit and all the data at different velocity because you can analyze different energy absorption methods. Okay, okay. Okay, last two. Why the auto-rotation of the projectile is neglected? The auto-rotation of the projectile? Uh, yes, is neglected. Uh, let's say that the auto-rotation is more related to the... Um, to, to stabilize the bullet. Uh, we did in the past some investigation, but we found that there is no effect. Um, for instance, uh, it's not the case of this kind of bullet, but there are other kind of bullet. If you move to the long road, the kinetic uh, armor, um, armor piercing finet bullet, uh, the rotation is uh, negative for the impact. So they prefer to shot this bullet in, uh, in barrel without any rotation to avoid this rotation and they put the fin. So there is, let's say that uh, the rotation in the bullet is mainly due to stabilize uh, the, the flight. The, the flight but in, yeah, in the terminal ballistic, we do not, we, we notice no effect. 
Okay, good. The last one, the last one. Uh, have you explored the use of other polymeric matrices, such as thermoplastic polyurethane, for these applications? Thermoplastic no. instead of thermosets. Never used? No. No. Never no. used, never used. Uh, there are a lot of a lot of possibilities, unfortunately. Never used. <laughs> Or fortunately, right? <laughs> <laughs> at least for the paper. <laughs> okay, okay. The last one, I think you have answered, right? So I'm not going to ask. So okay, I think I think that's it. I think that we ran out of time now. But I want to 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 thank you again, uh, Professor Albanis. It's it's been a pleasure having you here. I even mm -hmm. saw my my photograph there in the end, and that was nice to see our time in in Italy <laughs> together there. That's fine. <laughs> Yeah. And, I, and I thank you very much for this brilliant talk. I've had so many uh, good feedbacks here in my WhatsApp about, this, about your talk already. So, so, so thank you again. I'm gonna, we're going to pass to, to Andrea now to, to finish off okay, this session here. Thanks a okay. lot, Andrea. Thank Grazie you. Mille. Grazie mille. You are welcome. Prego. <laughs> it's on you, 